What is going on everyone? My name is Andy. Welcome back to another FPL video. In this one, it's some of my final thoughts ahead of the game week six deadline. So I'm going to go through the latest press conference information, answer some of your questions and take a look at my own team. And of course, my wildcard is active at the moment. But before all that, make sure you download Sleeper, which is a completely free fantasy football app using the links in the description below or the QR code on screen and join my Let's Talk FPL Pick'em League, which is completely free with prizes on offer. All you have to do is predict the results of each Premier League game every single week. And I'm going to show you how easy it is to do. So for my picks, I'm going to go for Man City to beat Newcastle and Arsenal to beat Leicester. Uh, Brentford to beat West Ham, especially with how poor West Ham are playing right now. I'm going to go for a Chelsea win against Brighton. Everton Palace, I think, is quite hard to call. So I'm just going to go for the draw. Uh, Forest to beat Fulham, Liverpool to beat Wolves, Villa to beat Ipswich, I've got to back Man United to beat Spurs as well, and then Bournemouth to beat Southampton. It's literally as simple as that. Once you're in the Let's Talk FPL League, your prediction scores will be added to the overall table. As you can see right now, I'm only on 24 points. There's people with 35 already from the first five game weeks, but it doesn't matter if you didn't join in game week one because there's prizes on offer every week. So between game weeks four and seven, whoever gets the most predictions every week will get a Premier League shirt of their choice. If it's a draw, like in game week five, where two people got 10 points, so every single prediction correct, I'll do a draw on the next deadline stream. So we'll find out the match day five winner on the game week six deadline stream. Completely free. There's lo loads of other great stuff in the app as well. Just use that QR code on screen or the link in the description below to give it a go. So we've got to start with Arsenal and Mikel Arteta pretty much said word for word what I would have expected him to say about David Raya. We have to wait another 24 hours. We have to wait 24 hours to see if it is looking good or not. It's not about risk. It is about a player being fit or available. We will make a decision tomorrow. Like, did anyone expect anything else? He was never going to tell us that he was fit for that game. Now, I don't... I've said this before. I just don't trust what Arteta says in press conferences. He loves to play mind games. And I would not be surprised if training photos come out after I've recorded this video and David Raya is just not in any of them and then he plays against Leicester tomorrow. That would not surprise me in the slightest. But going off what information we have, he is a doubt. Simple as that. And if you're on wildcard in particular, it's just not probably, sorry, it's probably not worth taking the risk on starting him unless you're going to go for a backup goalkeeper. But then you're spending 5.5 .5 and 4.5 at a minimum. And that just doesn't feel worth it. So unless we get any more information from the time I've recorded this video and put it out to the deadline tomorrow, you've probably got to go without David Raya because of the doubts there. And like I said, I would not be surprised whatsoever if he's in that team against Leicester. He'll probably go and save a penalty and get a clean sheet and then do amazing after that. But he's probably not going to be the be-all and end-all of how your season goes. And if you're dead set on double defense, you can just switch to Gabriel or Saliba instead. Or if you're on like, I don't know, Raya and Vardiol, you could just switch to Edison and Saliba, right? If you just wanted to stick to the same um, structure. So uh, there's not really too much more I can say. Um, there's no more information than that right now. All we know is that he was seen limping after the Man City game. He wasn't in the squad whatsoever for the Carabao Cup game. I personally don't think that's a big deal. Because he wasn't in the squad for either of the two Carabao Cup games last year either. I know they played a 16-year-old. I get that. So there is probably something there with Raya. I'm just not convinced it's enough for him to miss out. But if we don't get any more information, I'm just going to have to go without him. I don't see the point in, in taking the risk. So yeah, that's Arteta. I, I, again, I don't think we should have expected any more. Let's wait and see what the training photos show um, later this evening. We usually get them on a Friday. I'm not expecting to see him. I'm just not. So there was quite a bit of information from Pep Guardiola's Man City press conference. The first thing that he confirmed was that Rodri is out for the entire season. We already knew that he was going to miss a large chunk of this season, but he's going to miss the whole thing. So that is going to make Man City weaker. There's a stat going around that in the Premier League, when he plays, they win 74% of games. And without him, it's like 62%. Now, I've not dug into that deeper in terms of what are the actual matches that he missed, etc. But we can expect Man City to be not quite as good. And I guess if Arsenal were ever going to win the league, this might now be the time that it happens. In terms of whether we should worry about Man City players that we've got in our team, probably not just because of the fixtures. Newcastle away, Fulham at home, Wolves away, Southampton at home, next four are good. Like, I'm not going to suddenly get rid of Haaland. But if you were on the fence about going for a particular Man City player, 
this could be the thing that pushes you one way or the other. So Rodri out for the whole season. On Kevin De Bruyne, he's definitely not playing in the Newcastle game. Um, Pep was asked when he's going to return. He said, I don't know, before maybe the international break or after the international break, we will see. So you basically got two games, six and seven, then another international break ahead of game week eight. So De Bruyne is definitely missing Newcastle. He might miss game week seven as well. So if you've got him, he's a definite sell. Does this mean that Foden comes into the team? Possibly. He could be a nice punt, especially if we get a leak tomorrow that he's starting. And keep in mind that the Newcastle game in game week six is the first game of the game week. So the chances of getting Man City information ahead of the deadline is quite high. So potentially you could go for Foden. But I guess the question is, once De Bruyne is back, how much will Foden play? And that will probably be enough to put me off because I'm not convinced necessarily that Foden will move to the right wing when De Bruyne is back. He might just come out of the team completely. It could also be that De Bruyne ends up being out longer. It's just a bit of an unknown altogether. Pep was also asked if Rico Lewis and Kovacic is the solution to Rodri's absence. He said, it's one of them. I have a few more. Gundogan can play in that position. John Stones and the Kanji have played in that uh, position. We have alternatives to do it. So for anyone that is just still sitting there really wanting to go for Rico Lewis, but wants information that he's nailed on, you just are not going to get it. So from what Pep said, Rico Lewis could go and play inverted from defense into midfield, but so could John Stones. So could a Kanji. They've both done it before. I don't think a Kanji's done it for a while, although he did pretty well when he, he did it. And John Stones obviously wasn't around at the start of the season. He's only just back into that Man City team. So, so it's hard to know what he's going to do. It might be that Rico Lewis played so well in the first few games that he'll get the chance to continue doing that. It might be that just John Stones comes in. You just don't know. And also, just to point out again, if you get a leak that Lewis starts against Newcastle, it doesn't guarantee Fulham at home, Wolves away, Southampton at home. Likewise, if he's not in the 11 tomorrow, he could still start in game week seven. This is what you're putting... Oh, sorry, this is what's going to happen every single week with Lewis in your team. This is what you have to be okay with, the uncertainty. He's potentially an extremely good 4.7 million defender who could be great value, get a massive return at some point. He could also just not play. And if you're not comfortable with that, just pick someone else. So Pep has said it's one of the solutions, but he's also got a few more too. So for anyone that didn't see, Spurs played Carabag in Europe last night and Son went off with a bit of an issue in the second half. Now, I'm not quite sure what the issue was, but some people were speculating it might have been a bit of a hamstring problem. Ange Postacoglu spoke about him today. He said, apart from Sonny, everyone's okay. So if you're looking at like Solanke, Brennan Johnson, Madison, Porro, whoever it might be, they should be fine to bring in. He carried on talking about Son. He said, I don't think it's too bad. He wants to train tomorrow. We'll see how he goes, make a decision. We have another day up our sleeve to give him every chance. So Spurs don't play Man United away in game week six until half four on Sunday. So you've got another training session on Saturday. I think with Son, because of what Ange just said, he probably is way more likely to start than he isn't. It doesn't sound like it's a bad injury. So if you've got him and you weren't looking to sell, I'd probably just keep hold of him and play him. I'm sure he's going to be in that 11 for Man United away. On the flip side, there probably is enough small doubt there to not bring him in. So if you don't already own him, whether you were looking to transfer him in or you're on wildcard, I think I would just look elsewhere. There's plenty of other good options in midfield. You don't have to take the risk on Son. But if I had him, I don't know. I'm not saying I'm like 100% confident he'll start. But just going off what Ange just said, I'm sure he'll be fine. So good news for anyone that held Allison through game week five. It looks like he's going to be available for Wolves away in game week six. Arna Slot was asked whether he's ready to play. And he said, we think he is. He trained yesterday, a part of our session with the group. We're expecting him to do the whole session today. We think he's available. So if you've got him in your squad, pretty easy decision. If you're not on wildcard, just to play him against Wolves. No need to spend a transfer. And if you don't have Allison, you're probably not buying anyway. I also have to include this. When Slot was asked about Luis Diaz's goals, he said it's still, and by the way, this is Slot's words, not mine. It's still a small sample size we are talking about. Almost all the teams we have faced were bottom half of the table. There's still a lot for us to prove. Maybe the fixture list helped us to this amount of goals the forwards have scored. Let's see if we can keep scoring as many goals when the fixture list gets harder and harder. It's mainly the quality of the player he's finishing. He's always had this. So what I think Slot is trying to say 
is Luis Diaz is a good pick, but maybe he's not as essential as people are making out, and it's okay to not have him in your wild card if you don't want to go for him. But we can probably discuss Luis Diaz a little bit more later. So for anyone that held on to Izat last week, he's a doubt again for the Man City game in game week six. Eddie Howe said Alex is still nursing his toe injury. He will be a doubt for tomorrow. He hasn't trained yet, so we will have to make a decision on him. Now, for what it's worth, I'll say the same thing as last week. I suspect he'll play, especially when it's such a big match. But obviously, it's not a guarantee. It sounds like he's broken his toe, but it's manageable. It's all about the amount of pain. So I think he had an injection and he was fine. But then when that wore off, there was quite a bit of pain. So I guess it's just going to depend how he feels tomorrow. Either way, I think at this point, unless you're not wildcarding, and you've got a ton of other more important things to do. Isaac's probably getting to the point where he's not a must sell or anything like that. But you can't have these doubts every week. He's got Man City in game week six. It's Chelsea away in nine. It's Arsenal, I think, at home as well uh, in ten. I'm just going to double check that. Yeah, Arsenal at home in ten. So three in the next five are not great. And the other two are Everton away and Brighton at home. He and Newcastle haven't played particularly well. If you're considering getting rid of him, I think the consistent doubts around him the last couple of weeks... And Man City at home is probably as good a reason to get rid of him uh, as you're ever going to have. And just to quickly mention some replacements for Isaac in and around his price. I think the obvious ones that people will be uh, considering is Nicholas Jackson, who I think is a pretty decent pick. Uh, Brighton, Forest, and Newcastle all at home in the next three. The other game is game week eight against Liverpool. Away. Not bad as a short-term option. Uh, I really like Havertz, of course, as well. If you're not going... Double Arsenal defence. We're going to talk about that a little bit more later. But the next three fixtures are decent. Leicester at home, Southampton at home, Bournemouth away. And then if you do go the Havertz route, you know, he's 8.1 million. So he's a little bit cheaper than Isaac. You've then got a nice jump off in game week nine where Arsenal have got Liverpool at home, Newcastle away, Chelsea away. And at that point, potentially, you could look at someone like um, Solanke, who's even cheaper again. So from game week nine... Spurs have got Palace away, Villa at home, Ipswich at home. Then that City away game in 12, which is tough. Then Fulham at home. Even in game week eight, it's West Ham at home. So I don't mind even if you're looking at that fixture run thinking, well, I like Jackson now. I like Havertz. But long term, Solanke is the one. You could even just bring him in now. Man United away, Brighton away is not great. But it's not completely terrible either. So I like them. So if you're looking at someone in and around the price, it's probably... Havertz, Jackson, Solanke at the moment. Watkins, if you've got a bit of money in the bank, is definitely not a bad pick uh, either. But I'm talking about players who are less um, money than what Isaac is. And if you're going really down, like 6 million-ish, it's probably Calvert-Lewin or Chris Wood. All right, let's get into some of your questions. So if you've got Imbermo and Flecken, would you risk not having Valdemarsen in case Carvalho or Lewis Potter become an option? You've also got Vandenberg, £4 million defender from Brentford, Sharder at £5.4 million as well. I know he didn't start last week after I spoke about him, but if either of those two players force their way into that 11, they are potentially very good cheap options. Now, initially, when I was looking at my wild card, I thought I'd have a maximum of two Brentford players, and if one of them was Flecken... I was going to ignore Valdemarsen, who's the £4 million backup goalkeeper, just in case one of those cheap options became, you know, someone that I wanted to put in. And also, if you look at the the Brentford fixture run, like, it's pretty good for quite a while. It's not until maybe game week 18 where it gets a little bit tougher, where in the space of four game weeks, they got Brighton away, Arsenal at home, Man City at home. Even after the City game, it's then uh, Liverpool at home as well. But before that, especially for an attacker, even for a defender... The fixtures are really good. So even though you might not want them now, if you got to, say, game week 11, for example, and Sharda and Vandenberg are in the team, you've still then got to come. Bournemouth at home, Everton away, Leicester at home, Villa away, Newcastle at home, Chelsea away and Forest at home. It's still a pretty good fixture run, even if you don't have them for the next five game weeks. So it's a tricky spot, right? I, my, my instinct is that I would leave the space open just in case I want to go for them. But also, we've seen what's happened with the doubts around Raya this week. We saw what happened with Allison in game week five where he missed out. It's not nice to have a non-playing goalkeeper on the bench. And Valdemarsen fixes that. If Flecken gets injured, okay, that Brentford defence gets even weaker. But you're not forced into a transfer straight away. So I think because of what's happened with Allison missing out and the stuff around Raya, it's kind of pushed me more towards just going for Valdemarsen and just blocking off that third Brentford spot. Like if I think about how most people are setting up on wildcard, like if you're going for a four million pound defender, you're going to go for Greaves, I would say. Most people anyway. 
Like, is it going to be the end of the world if you can't go to Vandenberg? Probably not. And if you look longer term, Ipswich have got like Palace at home in 14, Bournemouth at home uh, in 15, Wolves away in 16. There are some games where you could play them anyway. Leicester at home in 10, Everton away in 8. Carvalho, Lewis Potter and Sharda are probably a bit more interesting because if something happens to Rodgers, like his minutes gets reduced or he gets injured, then potentially because of the fixtures Brentford have got, that is a nice jump off. But also, who knows down the line, you might have more money to spend. You could make a downgrade elsewhere, go up to like a Smith Row, Semenyo, McNeil, whoever it might be. I, I don't know where I stand on this. Like, if I was to put Flecken in my wildcard draft, would I go for Van Marsen or would I just leave the spot open? I've got a feeling because of what's happened recently with goalkeepers, I would just play it safe. And look, if I can't get to Carvalho down the line, so be it. It's, a, it's hard to know, right? Because you don't know what's going to happen in the future. You're either guaranteeing yourself a goalkeeper every week or you're potentially leaving yourself open to get a cheap Brentford option who may or may not become worthwhile. I feel like when you put it like that, you probably just put Valder Marsen in. So would you go Salah, Haaland and Saka skipping Trent Alexander-Arnold on wildcard or is Trent such a good pick that it's better to go no Salah? There is another option, by the way, and that is to go without Saka. So you could go Salah, Haaland and Trent and just not have the £10 million Arsenal midfielder instead. And if you wanted to triple up, you could still go double defence and Havertz instead. So that is another option. You could also just double up on Arsenal. You don't have to have a triple up just because it feels like everyone else is doing it. But either way, to answer the question, I'm a little bit biased because when I've been playing around with my own wildcard team, I've very rarely had Salah in whatsoever. So just bear that in mind. But when I think about the next player down if i'm going from salah the next expensive player is palmer right so straight away i'm saving like two million whereas if i drop trent i'm going down probably to like a robertson van dyke vardy or someone like that so straight away i just think the money saved from dropping salah is going to be more beneficial for the rest of the squad and that's why i don't have him in my team right now and also captaincy is quite a big thing when you're spending that much money on a player and no it doesn't mean you shouldn't have Salah just because you're not captaining him. But for me, it is a big factor. And I look at the fixtures that Haaland's got, who most people are going to have on wildcard. There are not many games there where you wouldn't want to captain him. And even one of the biggest ones, which is game week 13, it's Liverpool away. So Salah's got to play Man City that same game week. So if you don't want to captain either of them in that game, you're looking elsewhere anyway. I think game week 12, when Haaland plays Spurs at home, is interesting because Salah has... Southampton away, I believe it is. Yeah, Southampton away. So you might want him then. But that's, that's so many game weeks away. I feel like you just figure it out when you get closer. Now, saying that, I had a problem when I got to game week five because I hadn't thought about Salah enough in pre-season. So I'm not against going for him. But I just think going for Trent and not Salah and having that extra money to spend around is probably just a little bit better, especially for a player you're not going to captain that often over the next kind of four to six weeks, I would say. So with no obvious midfield option, should we be looking to double up on Man City defence alongside Haaland? And of course, you could consider that, but it's not essential to have three Man City players on wildcard. And I completely understand that if you're wildcarding now, you're looking at the next few fixtures, Newcastle away, Fulham at home, Wolves away, Southampton at home, Bournemouth away, thinking I've got to have three players from one of, if not the best team in the league. But it's not essential to have three. Like, if you're discounting the midfield options because you're not confident in them, you've still got to be confident in at least two of the defenders to get to that triple up. And I cannot guarantee you the minutes of any of them. I think Akanji in particular and Vardio are probably decent for minutes over those next four or five games. Can I sit here and tell you they'll definitely start all of them? Of course not. I know I sound like a broken record, but that is just a fact uh, with Man City. We, we've spoken about Rico Lewis a lot at 4.7 million. He's potentially great value. Can I guarantee you that he will start all the games? No. And you've got to remember that other players will score points. Like, we always want to target players from the best teams. That makes a lot of sense. But it's not always the case that they are the best FPL picks. So I said something maybe on a video or a tweet um, last week or, or this week. I can't quite remember. But I essentially said that Brian Inbermo is a player who I would pick ahead of any Liverpool attacker right now, apart from arguably Mo Salah, because he's nailed on, the fixtures are amazing, he's on penalties, there's no concerns over his minutes whatsoever. And a few people took offence at that, mostly Liverpool fans, especially because Luis Diaz has done so well right now. 
But that is how I feel. I would personally pick Brian Imbermo before Luis Diaz, even though Brentford are not as good as Liverpool. And as a player, you could probably argue that Imbermo is not as good as Diaz either. Although some people might argue the other way, but I'm not getting into that right now. I just think Brian Imbermo is generally quite good. But you get the point, right? Just because Liverpool are better than Brentford, it doesn't mean you have to pick their players. And I think it's the same with Man City. Like, I keep going back and forth on Rico Lewis. Yeah, amazing value, right? But if he doesn't play all these games, there's other 4.5 million defenders with decent fixtures as well. Vardio, amazing if he plays all these games. If he doesn't, would I just not be better off getting Pedro Porro from Game Week 8 onwards, who is going to play all those games? So you can definitely consider the double up, but I don't think it's essential. But if you are confident in like Vardio and Lewis or Vardio and Akanji, then yes, there are very good clean sheet opportunities over the next four to five weeks. The only team that's probably better than Man City for clean sheets is Arsenal. And most people are on a double up or at least one of their players. Just really quickly, by the way, on the midfielders, Savio has started every game he's been fit for. I, I, I think he was out injured for the West Ham game. I can't quite remember, but he started four or five. Um, he's also started a, a few of the other non-Premier League games as well. And he seems to be first choice right winger. So if you want to take a punt at 6.5 million, I don't mind that. Again, I don't know if he's going to start every game, but you already know that. And of course, if we get a leak that someone like Foden is an option, and 9.3 million, he could be decent as well. But again, it's a lot of money for a player that you're probably not massively confident will start every one of those games. So I'm going to talk about my team later, but I would not be surprised if I have one City player, and that's Haaland, a maximum of two. I'm just not convinced I'm going to go with three. So are we overlooking Kai Havertz? He's a cheaper route into the Arsenal attack. Now, I spoke about double defence versus double attack in the game week preview on Wednesday, so I'll try and keep this brief. Essentially, if you want to go for Havertz, you should. In his own right, at 8.1 million, with the fixtures that Arsenal have got in the next three game weeks, he is a good pick. Odegaard is missing, so at times, will Havertz drop a little bit deeper? Possibly. But I think just because of the fixtures they've got on paper, he is going to get chances. So I really like him. And if you wanted to go double defence and Havertz instead of going for Saka, that is perfectly fine. In that Saka spot, you can have Palmer or Salah or even someone much cheaper and just spend that money elsewhere. If that's what you want to do, especially if you've got no consideration for Saka as captain whatsoever, that is fine. Similarly, if you want to go for one defender and then Havertz and Saka, also a really good move. The reason that a lot of people, and myself included, are going for double defence is the idea is just to put them in and forget about it. Yes, they've got that run. Game weeks 9 to 11, Liverpool at home, Newcastle away, Chelsea away, which is not great. But we know how good they can be defensively. Goal threat and stuff from Gabriel as well. Save points from Raya. It's not a massive problem for me. And I just think the three game weeks before and then most of the game weeks afterwards just look really good for double defence. And because I'm not going to get to wildcard again for a very long time, I just want to put the two of them in and leave it. And for me, Saka is the best option to go for, for that kind of £10 million price point. And then up front, I like Jackson, I like Solanke, I like Chris Wood, Calvert-Lewin. So I don't feel like Habits is a necessity or anything like that. But it's all personal preference, right? You might want to go Flecken in goal, Gabriel and Vardio, and not go for Saliba. Then you've got Saka and Habits. It's fine. Whichever way you want to go works. Like one way is going to end up being the best, but I don't think anyone can sit here right now and say it's definitely this one. But for me, I'm really liking the idea, and I did it last year. I wildcarded in 10 with Gabriel, I got Saliba in 12, and I just left them for the whole season, pretty much. And that's kind of the idea now. Put Gabriel in, right, and Saliba or Raya, and then just leave it for ages. And so that's why I'm not looking at Havertz. So he's being overlooked by some people for that reason. It does not mean he's a bad option. If you want to pick him, go for it. So is getting rid of Trent Alexander-Arnold for an Arsenal defender like Gabriel worth it? Now, this is one of those questions when you first see it. Your instinct is to say no, because Trent is just so good. And actually going through with pushing that button to take him out of your team is quite difficult, right? So when you actually come to transfer him out, it's not going to feel that fun. But when I've thought about it a bit more, I think it probably is worth it overall. Like if we're taking game week six into in isolation, it's quite close. Yes, Gabriel's got more chance for a clean sheet. We know that he's got quite a lot of attacking threat as well. But Wolves away is not a terrible fixture and Trent is brilliant going forward. So it's quite close. But then you look at game week seven included. Well, Arsenal got Southampton at home. Another really good fixture. 
for Trent it's Palace away and that's more difficult than Wolves away then it's Chelsea at home then it's Arsenal away so overall you look at the next four game weeks Gabriel probably does have much better chances of getting clean sheets in most of those weeks and then you add the threat that he's got from set pieces as well and the fact he's cheaper it probably is worth it but as always with questions like this it really depends on what your plans are if you're on wildcard and you could only have one of these two I think I would pick Gabriel right now and go for Trent later on. If you're wildcarding in, say, game week eight, then I'd probably just get Gabriel for the next two weeks and then think about getting Trent back in later. It's difficult without knowing all the other plans that are going on. But in isolation right now, if I was picking only one, it would be Gabriel. And obviously the money could come in handy for other moves as well. One thing to point out, and try not to let price changes completely dictate your moves, but I was looking on Hub and Gabriel is... 84.5% to another rise. So he's already gone up to 6.1. He could go to 6.2. And they're predicting that could happen tonight. Now, that's not a guarantee, but it might be the case. But you've also got to remember that if you've got Trent for 7, he's already gone up to 7.1. And I don't know if he is. Let me just double check. How is he looking on prices? Yeah, he's not going to rise anytime soon, but he's also not being sold that heavily. So he's plus 31%. So he's not likely to come down from 7.1 anytime soon. And so if you want to buy him back, it's going to cost you a little bit more. So it's not a straightforward decision, but I think overall, in most cases, it probably makes more sense to have Gabriel than Trent right now. So since this week seems to be the most popular wildcard week, are those not on wildcard suffering team value wise? I feel like I'm 0.5 million behind. Now, first thing to say is try and not worry about it too much because ultimately it's happened now. You can't go back in time and pop your wild card. That value has been lost. But also, you probably had some of the players that have gone up that people have benefit, uh, benefited from from being on wild card. So for me, for example, uh, in Burma, I think Gabriel and Raya have all gone up 0.1 million. So has Calvert-Lewin as well. But I already had Calvert-Lewin in my team anyway. So if I hadn't wild card, I would have got that gain Luis Diaz has gone up twice which is quite nice I've made 0.1 million on him already but it's not been like massive so if you already had like one or two of those players in your team you're probably not as far behind as you think but other factors play into team value there's people like Luke and Praz that I've spoken about a lot this week about wildcard teams they've both got more money than me and I'm on wildcard as well and there's plenty of other people that kept Kwanzaa kept in Kunku who are behind so loads of things come into team value in general it's always going to feel worse if you don't wildcard in a popular week like look at game week four when i got past the deadline i started seeing people's wildcard teams i was quite jealous that i hadn't hit the button get to the end of game week four not really that worried anymore get to the end of game week five really wasn't a problem it could be the same in game week six especially if you already had a lot of the popular players and there will be other times to make gains from the wildcard. It's not just about team value. It's also about points as well. So some people will go in 8, 10, 12, maybe hold on to it even longer. Like, if I think back to last season, I didn't go in game week 8 when a lot of people did. I think if I'm comparing this season to last season so far, game week 6 feels a lot like game week 8. Loads of people went in for Aston Villa players in particular. They all went up in price. And it was kind of made out at the time that you would just be stuck if you didn't wildcard. It wasn't the case. I went in game week 10. Cole Palmer became an option all of a sudden. But there's always going to be value players like that. Let's say you wildcard in, I don't know, game week 15, right? Just off the top of my head. And there's been injuries at Man City. And all of a sudden, they're really value players are all there for the taking. You might then make some money later on. Like It's, it's just not something I'd massively wa uh, worry about. I was going to say wildcard about then. Uh, worry about. You either needed it or you didn't. If you felt you didn't need it, I wouldn't massively worry about the team value. Um, also, by the way, like some of the team value is only... Like Diaz, for example, I can say I've made 0.1 million. But if I keep hold of him, I don't actually get to spend that 0.1 until I sell him. Yes, okay, I got him a little bit cheaper than everyone else who didn't already own him. Same with Gabriel and Raya. But it's only great if they then go on to do really big things. And, and that might not be the case. So... Yeah, I'm just trying to make people feel better. Like, it's really not the end of the world. I'm already behind Team Rally for some people. I'm in front uh, from others. Generally, there is always a cheap option that you can go for instead. Like, again, just really quickly on this, some of the drafts that I've put together, like, it might just be the case that I've got Solanke and someone with lower Team Rally has to go for Chris Wood instead, but every other player is the same. Like, is that one player going to make such a big difference over a season? Probably not. 
so just don't worry about it. You haven't done it. You can't do, do anything about it now. If you don't need the wild card, just wait. So wild card six teams all look very similar. Which commonly featured player would you bet against? Now you're going to see my team in a minute anyway, but I'm just going to quickly go through the players that are in nearly every wild card team and just talk about other options you could possibly go for. So double defense for Arsenal, we talked about quite a lot. You could just go for double attack instead. No issues with that whatsoever. Trent Alexander-Arnold is probably a really good long-term hold, but I think two away games, then Chelsea at home and Arsenal away, doesn't necessarily screen massive amounts of clean sheets. So you could potentially just go for no Liverpool defense whatsoever and then bring them in later. I probably won't be doing that myself, but you could. Rico Lewis is really popular. And I think if we get a leak tomorrow that he's starting against Newcastle, it'll be in a lot of people's teams. But there's no guarantee that means he keeps his place afterwards. So you could definitely bet against that. Um, and, and Man City defence in particular. In Burma, I wouldn't bet against. Semenyo is not essential. You could go for McNeil. You could go for Smith Rowe. You could find money to upgrade that spot completely to like an Eze or a Savio or someone like that. And especially when it's only really the next two games for Bournemouth, Southampton are home and Leicester away that you really think, sorry, that, that like he's really great for, because after that, it's like Arsenal, Villa, and City. Now, I personally don't think Villa away is that bad to play him in, and the fixtures after City are pretty good, but only two of the next five are really decent. So if you could get away without him for the next two, you've probably got a player that's got better long-term fixtures. Morgan Rogers, if I got a 5 million, I probably wouldn't bet against. If you're having to pick him up at 5.2, you can maybe find a little bit more money to go for someone like McNeil or Semenyo. But are they that much better than Rodgers, considering he keeps playing like 90 minutes every game? Number 10 for Aston Villa. Not convinced. Saka, perfectly reasonable to go for Palmer, someone like that, or someone a lot cheaper. Haaland, probably not. And Calvert-Lewin, if you wanted to go for Chris Wood instead, something like that in the same price, you absolutely could. And, and one player I forgot to put here um, is actually Luis Diaz. Like He could be a player you could bet against but i think you're only you're, you're only really doing it if you think that he could get benched sometime soon um i think slot in his press conference mentioned that you know he and and gakpo are getting chances they're both scoring like at some point over the next kind of four or five games gakpo could start one of them and luis diaz does keep getting subbed off early and slot himself said it's a small sample size i think you could argue that every game so far for liverpool has been pretty good like even man united away right i don't think let me just double check i don't, I don't think casemiro started since that game like i'm not saying that liverpool wouldn't have won anyway but he was terrible yeah hooked at half time three minutes against southampton zero against palace so like if liverpool played man united right now they probably would still win i'm not sure if it would be as easy as that match ended up um being necessarily but maybe it would maybe i'm just uh there's, there's some copium there possibly but anyway back to luis diaz like he's a player that i keep thinking about betting against but i also think it's perfectly reasonable just to put him in for the next two and then decide what to do afterwards and like at his price he's a great jump off to like a madison a bowen or someone like that but i, th I think i don't know like on that list i think triple arsenal for me he's got to be in i think trent's pretty decent in Burmo's great. I like Semenyo. I love Rogers. Harlan's brilliant. Cavalier's nice and cheap. Like Diaz is probably one of the players that I will consider betting against the most. But it's not a guarantee I do that. Let's talk about my team. So I'm going to end the video by talking about my own team. And my wild card is currently active. But I'm going to be real with you. I'm like every other FPL manager that's on wild card this week. I am spending hours and hours on it, far more than I should be and constantly tinkering to the point where whatever I show you now will probably be different a couple of hours after I put this video out and that draft will probably be different again to what I end up on close to the deadline tomorrow because if I wasn't streaming and making videos I'd still be sat there right up until the deadline making changes to my team and I'm not sure what's gonna make me settle on a final draft other than I have to get something locked in by 11 a.m tomorrow but anyway let's talk through what it looks like right now goalkeepers are currently Raya and Fabianski I'm completely aware that Raya is a risk I'll come on to other goalkeepers in a minute my five defenders are Gabriel, Mikalenko, Porro, Trent and Colwell from Chelsea five midfielders are Saka, Rogers, Semenyo and Bermo and Eze and then up front I've got Solanke, Calvert-Lewin and Haaland now in terms of players that are absolutely locked in I don't see me going without Haaland Calvert-Lewin, Imbermo, Semenyo, Rogers, Saka, Gabriel. Those seven players. And Trent Alexander-Arnold, 
is is almost there as well. It's only because of the price, and I've considered, you know, maybe going down to like a Vardio and spending a million elsewhere that I wouldn't put him as a locked player. But I'm pretty sure he's going to be in the team by the time we get to the deadline tomorrow. Everyone else is up for consideration to swap. Um, Mikalenko, I'm pretty sure, will make it as well because he's only 4.3. I'm expecting Everton defence to improve with the fixtures they've got coming up. Branthwaite is back as well. You know, he could be moved to Greaves if I needed more money. Now, the main difference is from the draft yesterday, if I can remember what I put out on team selection, is I've got Eze instead of Luis Diaz. Now, Luis Diaz is a really good pick. And I think it is worth remembering, just because I don't have someone in my team, it doesn't mean I think they're terrible. But he is a player that, I don't know, I've just got a feeling that I can bet against him. And it could be absolute pain. I get that. His ownership is so high. He's gone up to 8 million. So if I sell him, it's going to cost me even more to buy him back. But I think if the damage is minimal in game week six, Palace away, Chelsea at home, Arsenal away, I'm almost willing to to take that on, basically. Um, I suspect he'll be in a lot of other people's drafts. And I suspect for a lot of people, it will just be just put him in for Wolves and Palace and then decide what to do afterwards. That is fine. But I've only got one transfer from game week seven. And I don't really want to pre-book too many moves. I'd rather just see what happens and then start reacting as we get a couple of game weeks down the line. So I'm not saying I won't go for Diaz, but I think there's a high chance that he's not in my team. I, I just feel like I could probably spend the money better elsewhere. And I may regret that. That's fine, right? I'm not going to get everything right in FPL. So at the moment, Eze is in because that allows me to get Solanke up front and then Trent, Porro, and Gabriel in defence. I think it just makes my squad stronger overall, so that if I get issues, I've got other players on the bench um, that I can play. Porro's not great for the next two, United away and Brighton away, but he is nailed on, and I like the fixtures from eight. And Colwell has got Brighton at home and Forest at home. Now, I don't think they're super easy fixtures for Chelsea, but I'm banking on the Chelsea defence being pretty good going forward. And so essentially, I would play Trent, Gabriel, then one of Mikalenko or Colwell this week, and then I'd play Colwell in game week seven, and then I'd have Poro back in the team from game week eight. And I quite like Colwell uh, as a 4.5 because you have got three home games in the next four, and then yes, he's got to play Man United away and Arsenal at home, but then you've got Leicester away, Villa at home, Southampton away. He could be played in any of them. Longer term, Brentford at home in 16, Fulham at home in 18, Ipswich away in 19. There's quite a few fixtures from now until like game week 22 that I could potentially use him in. And he does seem to be nailed in that Chelsea back line. Like there's a lot of rotation and, and minutes, you know, being managed or, or whatever in the attack. But he's played 90 minutes every game. I don't see him coming out of that team. So I quite like him as a 4.5. That could be Pinnock. He's got good fixtures for Brentford right now. It could be Brighton, again, another team I quite like because if you look at their fixtures, they're pretty poor in the short term. Like Wolves at home in nine is the only game I'd really want to play them from now until game week 11. But after that, the fixtures get really good. Bournemouth away, Southampton at home, Fulham away, Leicester away, Palace at home. So if I'm playing Mikalenko this week, Gabriel and Trent, I don't necessarily need my Brighton defender. And I could just play Mikalenko next week as well. Then Poro comes in. Van Heck or Dunk are then longer term moves. I guess what I should address is I haven't got Lewis. Um, I just, I don't know. I go back and forth on this. Really good option, potentially. Also could just be terrible. Um, and I don't cope well with, that, that sounds a bit dramatic, right? But I'm just not a fan of Man City players. Because as soon as he gets benched, I'm just going to be frustrated about it. So why put myself in that position? And I get it, right? I'm not stupid. There's there's clean sheets on the horizon. But once you get past Southampton at home, it's like four, three away games in the next four. The home game is Spurs. The away games are Bournemouth, Brighton, and Liverpool. They're all pretty good attacks. Like, are we going to get to game week 13 and Lewis is still starting regularly? Like, how many of the next five games do I think he'll start? He could start four or five, or he could start two or three. Or none. None is a possibility, right? Like, is he that good? Like, if he starts against Fulham, clean sheet, assist, goal, it could happen. He could go and smash an 18-pointer. He also just might not start. And, like, do I want to set myself up for a transfer? Like, that will be the argument from lots of other people. 
you put Lewis in because he's a potential bargain, then you just spend a transfer later on. But stuff will happen over the next few weeks. I don't know if I want to be using my transfer on a player I already know is a risk. I almost want to go for a more secure squad so I can react better to injuries and stuff. Um, other points in this, I will come on to the goalkeepers in a second. Like Solanke, um, I really like because the Spurs fixtures from eight onwards, but I could go for Chris Wood instead. I'm open to that and then spend the extra money elsewhere. That could be to put Luis Diaz back in, Bruno Fernandes, whoever it might be, or I might just beef up the defense. Um, but I don't know, Solanke versus Wood, if I've got the money, I'd probably just go for Solanke. But I think Chris Wood is a really good cheap forward option. I'm just going to go for Calvert-Lewin because I got him at 5.9. So if it's one or the other, I'm going to go Calvert-Lewin, but I'm open to both. Um, yeah, goalkeepers. What's going to make me keep Raya? I guess I can't unless we get... I should have maybe addressed this first. If we don't get any more info, I've probably got to go without him. I'm like 99% certain he's going to start and, and Arteta is just fooling us all like he always does. Um, but if he doesn't play, I don't think it's likely that I go to Edison. I think it's more likely that I go to Flecken. So I'd put Flecken in. I would have to get a, another Arsenal defender. I wouldn't want to go without. So I'd put Saliba in probably. And then the decision is whether or not to keep Poro. Because that's quite an expensive back line. So I could just get rid of Poro, go back to... Mikalenko, and then I've still got the money to go and get Solanke up front. So that that would be the main change. I'd put Flecken in and I'd upgrade uh, Poro to Saliba. Then I've also got 0.7 million left over, which isn't quite enough to go back to Diaz. But I could just bank that. I don't have to spend that money right away. So that's one option. One thing I've considered, which I don't see me doing, is Trent to Vardiol, because I'm pretty confident Vardiol is going to start quite a lot. He's also dropped to 5.9. And then do like Mikelenko to Lewis and just go for double Arsenal, double City. I've also got 1.4 in the bank. I'd probably buy Bruno Fernandes or Lewis Diaz. So that looks quite nice. But one of my thoughts is how do I get back to Trent Alexander-Arnold? Maybe that's something that I can think about down the line because they've got that Arsenal away game in nine. So I wouldn't necessarily need Trent back until 10. But then I'm setting myself up for a double move. Like if I did, let's just say I do Eze back to Diaz and have Solanke, I've only got 0.4 in the bank. So there's no way to get from Vardy or to Saliba straight up to Trent. I'd have to downgrade somewhere else. And that could just be Luis Diaz or Solanke later on, but that's a two transfer move. So I don't know if I want to put myself in a position to go for Man City defenders and just not have Trent. So I think if if Raya is still a doubt tomorrow and I've got to go without him, I think the most likely lineup is something like this. Let me just put Eze back in here. Um, and then, who did I have in here? Mikalenko. It's probably something like this. So, Flecken in goal, Gabriel, Mikalenko, Saliba, Trent, Carwell. The rest of the team is exactly the same as what I said before. 0 0.7 million in the back. I don't know if I would spend that, to be honest. I could go Mikalenko to a 4.5, like Pinnock or, or Dunk or something like that, but I just think I'd probably just hold it for later on. Um, like, Eze could go up to, like, a Bowen. I'm not completely against him. But th this is what I mean. I I'm not settled. I could spend another half an hour talking about my team, and I wouldn't get any closer to what I finally want to go with. But Bowen, possibly, if I've got the money. But I just think Eze is a good long-term pick still, despite how badly um, he's done for me. So I'd probably end up on on something like that, if Ray is not an option. But I really want to go for Raya. Just a cheaper way into that Arsenal defence. Uh, what else is there to say? I think that's probably it. Um, there's probably loads of players that people are going to be saying, why are you not considering him? Why are you not considering that player? But I've narrowed it down quite a bit. I think that's something I'm happy with. But there's something nagging at me that Chris Wood is just a better option than Solanke because of the value. I, I just think I'm in a position where if I do Solanke to Wood, I've then got money to spend. I feel like I've got to spend it. And then I'd probably go from Eze to Diaz or Fernandez. And just leave it at that. And then maybe just bank 0.7 million. I don't know. I think ultimately, I wouldn't be surprised if Vardio ends up in my team. I quite like holding Poro for game week 8 onwards. I'm quite happy to bench against Diaz. It doesn't mean that I'll have Fernandes. I might just go Eze and Solanke. That's the kind of things that I'm, I'm toying with. It will come down to the deadline tomorrow. I'm not trying to create suspense or, or make it better for the content. I, I just don't know. Um... And in the end, it will just be the deadline that decides it. And I think sometimes when you get close to the deadline, 
that does make you think no, i've just got to go with this and, and it, sometimes it makes you think what you really believe so i'm hoping i'll get i don't know something that tells me this is what you should go for i'll leave it there give it a like hit subscribe download sleeper links in the description below uh, rate five stars if you listen on podcasts and i'll catch you for the deadline stream tomorrow starting at 9 a.m